Alrighty, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, can you guys in South Dakota hear me? I'll take silence as a yes. So uh, today is computational fluid dynamics. So on Thursday we talked about just fluid flow. Now we're going to talk about computational fluid flow. Uh, nobody cares about the legal slide. Uh, just kind of a quick outline of where we're going to go on this talk. Uh, what is CFD? Um, applications of CFD? Why do you want to use CFD? And then basically a quick kind of overview of how you actually solve a problem with CFD. Um, then look at a couple of uh, case studies and then some concluding remarks. So what is CFD? Well, the name, just breaking down the name, it's computational. Well, it has something to do with computers, mathematics, you know, perhaps doing um, physical calculations on computers, and fluid dynamics, um, dealing with um, fluid flow. So we're doing something about computing fluid flow. <coughs> And a quick note, the difference between fluid flow and a fluid. Uh, a fluid is a substance that continually deforms or flows under an, under an applied shear stress. Um, obviously, it has physical properties associated with uh, that material. Uh, common example, air, water, oil, gas. Uh, other materials such as um, polymers, ketchup, honey, molasses, silly putty, stuff like that. And fluid flow is dealing with the actual motion um, of those fluids. So you see these everywhere. Uh, you know, big one probably is uh, weather forecasting, so meteorological phenomena, uh, wind, winds, hurricanes, floods, etc. Uh, environmental hazards have a lot to do with uh, fluid flow, how the, how the different uh, pollutants are dispersed in whether it be the atmosphere or you know, the ocean. Um, interactions with various objects with the surrounding air, water, i.e., you know, wind tunnels um, for uh, cars or planes, and then um, uh, uh, tow tanks for uh, boat design. Uh, and then biological processes and the human body, or really just any animal body, you know, breathing, blood flow, et cetera. Uh, some applications of CFD. You see CFD um, in more and more industries all the time. The number of industries that CFD is being used in is continually expanding. Um, anywhere from aerospace, for example, the 787 was completely, completely designed on computer and was simulated using CFD, and they had actually finalized the design before they built the first physical model and stuck it in a wind tunnel. Um, architecture, making sure that the building's not going to fall down um, under high wind load. Uh, people tend to appreciate that. Um, weather simulations, so atmos atmospheric simulations. Uh, flow assurance, I don't know if anyone's a uh, PE, petroleum engineer out there, but uh, oil and gas, flow assurance engineers use a lot of CFD to make sure that the wells are going to continue to flow. Um, automotive, uh, automotive is actually kind of an interesting one in that it's not just you know, aerodynamic to see you know, is the you know, what's the coefficient of drag for the car, what's the car's max speed. But there's a lot of thermal issues with cars, too. So one big area in automotive that CFD is used a lot is underhood thermal analysis, basically making sure that your engine doesn't overheat and that when you're driving down the highway, enough air is getting under the hood and is cooling the engine. Uh, civil engineering, that's architecture, basically. Process industry, just kind of in general, steel, wastewater, um, water, uh, combustion, no combustion. Um, more and more now, you actually also see this in healthcare, where um, when hospitals are designing new operating rooms, they'll actually do a CFD of the operating room itself to see the the, uh, the airflow patterns to try to um, you mean know, make sure you're not recirculating you know dirty air on onto the patient. But the one we're kind of interested in in you know combustion engineering class is CFD that involves combustion. Um, so you see this in process heaters a lot, not a lot, but all the time. Uh, and these are just a couple of examples where we have a, it's called a cabin heater because it looks like a cabin. Um, and then the, the colored volumes there are the predicted flame shapes using CFD. So this is what the, the software is predicting that the flame is going to look like. Uh, we have another cabin. And then we have a little bit of a movie looking at more of a transient type 
of analysis to see how, how are the flames going to move uh, with time. Um, you'll see it in boilers. So if you don't want to necessarily uh, heat up oil, if you just want to boil water and make steam, <laughs> use boilers. Uh, CFD is used a lot in there. Um, in flares, a lot. So again, you know, uh, later in the class when you guys get to you know your process heating and, and boiler burner and flare chapters, you'll learn a little bit more about these. But uh, CFD is used a lot in flare uh, simulations. Let's see if this movie works. So that's just looking at uh, basically the exhaust plumes from a couple of flares down to the the bottom left and sweeping through different temperatures. And so obviously as the hot gas comes out of the flare, uh, it's going to be mixing with you know cool atmospheric gas, so it's kind of bulk temperatures going to decrease and you see what the, we call it a plume, but basically what the kind of the downstream uh, air temperature of the flare will be. So you see it starts off hot and it's very small because it hasn't had time to mix with much atmospheric air but as it mixes with more and more atmospheric air, you know, kind of downstream of it, it gets cooler and the enclosed volume uh, increases too. So why do we use CFD? Why don't we just, um, you know, build a, a pilot plant or go to the lab and test something? Uh, one of the big things is, is that because with CFD you're calculating everything everywhere. So you're calculating the entire volume calculating every conserved variable at every point in that volume, actually a finite number of discrete points, but beyond that. Um, whereas with, you know, a test plant or a lab, you know, if you're physically putting in, you know, a, a temperature probe, you know, there's a finite number of points, you know, generally very small number of points that you can actually gather data. And especially when you start talking about, well, I want to, you know, if you want to look at, like, inside the flame, Finding uh, probes that can handle those conditions uh, can be difficult and or very expensive. Um, another thing is is that you know the, just the sheer impossibility of experimenting. You know we can't very well build a second Earth to experiment what happens if the weather does this. Um, so we have to simulate it in a computer because we just can't um, experiment it, experiment with it. And that also goes for stuff that we could in theory, but it's just economically prohibitively expensive. So, you know, a you know, process heater might cost several million dollars. It's not really feasible to build a test several million dollar heater at full scale, test it out at a cost of, you know, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a day to then figure, all right, that's good, let's build the real one now. You know, it, it doesn't make sense to do that, so you, you simulate it. Um, and then this is just kind of a you know marketing evaluate new designs and new operating conditions. So let's say that you have a you know an existing fired heater that's firing you know let's say natural gas, and now you want to shift it to kind of a natural gas hydrogen propane blend gas, and you want to make sure that everything is going to you know still be safe and still work properly. Well, you can run a CFD simulation of it to make sure that everything is going to work before you actually make the change in real life. And then also, you know, just, just kind of efficiency, you know, because you're not having to build, you know, potentially multi-million dollar or multi-tens of millions of dollar uh, test facilities or test, you know, test heaters for this, uh, you can get a lot more experimentation done uh, faster and less expensive. So... Uh, that it measures everything everywhere. How about emissions, uh, chemical reactions? Is that taken into consideration? Yes. Yeah, so we ca so right now we we measure uh, or I mean we take into account um, chemical reactions. So the chemical the reactions of the fuel and oxidizer. So the flame reaction. Emissions are a little bit more complicated of a topic and are still an issue of active academic research. Um, that's really all I, I really should say about that. Um, if, if you want, after, after the main lecture, we can get into a little bit more of the math onto why it's difficult to do that. Um, but yeah. Okay.
So um, how do we solve uh, an equation, or how do we solve a problem with CFD? Well, so if you remember back to your fluids class, you were probably told that tau equals minus mu dv dy. Well, that was kind of a lie. That is true for one-dimensional flow. But obviously flow is three-dimensional and temporal. So it's really four-dimensional flow. So if you extend that to all three dimensions and allow for um, advection, convection basically, and for um, transientness of the flow, you get these set of equations called the Navier-Stokes equations. And those are a set of um, partial differential equations that mathematically describe uh, fluid flow. Um, they've never been fully solved analytically, except for you know edge cases that you know um, ignore a bunch of a bunch of terms. Um, incidentally, the Clay Math Society has a million dollar prize for anyone who can prove the smoothness of the Navier-Stokes equations. So if you're looking for a way to pay for school, um, go for it. Um, and I, you know, they're, they're partial differential equations, but in the world of CFD, what we do is we discretize them. So we take them from a set of partial differential equations to a set of um, algebraic equations. And basically what we do is we take the volume of interest. Um, so basically, basically CFD is dealing with the negative volume, if you, say, if you think of it that way. So if you take a process heater and you fill it up with water, what shape is the water in? That's the shape that CFD is interested in. And basically we take that volume and we discretize it into a series of finite volume cells, so little volumes, and we, we call that a mesh. And then we take the uh, partial differential equations and transform them into a set of algebraic equations. And then uh, we can solve the algebraic equations. And basically CFD is the science of taking those governing partial differential equations and converting them into sets of um, algebraic equations, which you can solve by computer. So the momentum equation, the Navier-Stokes equation, is the partial with respect to time of rho v plus del, which um, you know is, is del, del dot rho v v. And this is your term that takes care of your convection, your bulk fluid motion. Uh, it's also a nonlinear term, and that's where most of the headaches of solving fluid equations comes from. Equals minus del P, which is just your, your pressure gradient. So your, your driving pressure gradient. Ta or plus del dot tau, where tau is your stress tensor. And this is where uh, Newton's law of viscosity comes in. And then plus body forces, which uh, in most cases are just going to be gravity. But uh, if you have like a magnetic fluid that's, on, that's in a magnetic field, obviously you're going to have some magnetic body forces in addition to gravity. Um, these are the this is the equation for momentum. There's uh, analogous equations for uh, energy, temperature. Uh, and species mass fractions. And then also when you get into uh, turbulent flows, there's um, equations for turbulence and um, reacting flows too. So in order to take that PDE and transform it into a set of algebraic equations, we first have to create our, our mesh. So we have our mesh in here. Let's just call it you know, just kind of a regular uh, rectangular or Cartesian mesh. And what we want to know is what's the value of del u del x at point ij. So this is point ij. Uh, so the x, the x uh, coordinates are labeled with i. So you know, this is uh, point i or u i j, u i minus 1 j, u i plus 1 j, and then uh, y is in j. So u i j plus 1 ui j minus 1. Well, if we take a Taylor series expansion of that partial differential equation, 
find that f of x plus delta x is f of x plus del f del x delta x plus del squared f del x squared times delta x squared over 2, so forth and so on. So if we apply that to the velocity on the grid, so basically we're looking at ui and then ui minus 1j and ui plus 1j, you find that ui plus 1j equals this expansion and u of i minus 1j is that expansion. Don't worry, you're not going to be tested on the derivations. A collective thank God from the from the class. Um, and so, again, doing that and then taking just a um, central difference formula from finite difference is basically saying that you are, you know, x of i plus 1 plus x of i minus 1 over 2 delta x is approximately equal to that derivative. And then plugging those in, we can say that, um, and then similarly for uh, your, par your double partials, basically you take those Taylor series expansions and plug them in and you use that uh, to formulate your algebraic equations. Now you have um, equations in terms of um, just the actual values rather than their partial values. So you now have, you know, basically three equations for uh, velocity for x, y, and z. You have an equation for what amounts to pressure, your continuity equation. And then you have equations for energy, temperature, and then any species or turbulence or um, other um, physics that you might be simulating. And the algorithm that most CFD softwares use is called SIMPLE, the semi-implicit method for pressure-linked equations. And basically, it runs in a loop where the first step is to update your properties. Basically say, what's the, you know, the temperature, the pressure, the species mole fractions at each point in the grid and say, okay, well, what's the specific heat? What's the viscosity? What's the, what, you know, any, whatever, uh, whatever uh, properties you need. And then solving sequentially, you find what your u, v, and w velocities are, where u is your x velocity, v is your y velocity, and w is your z velocity. So you're solving for u, v, and w. And then what you do is you solve what's called the pressure correction equation, which is del p del t plus del rho v equals s sub m. Uh, and basically this is saying, uh, now that you've solved your velocities, what would that mean that your pressure would have to be in order to satisfy? those problems, or that, um, that set of velocities. And you, then you update your mass flux because you now have new velocities, so the amount of mass that is going from one cell to the, um, the next cell is going to be changing. Uh, update your pressures and velocities. And then solve any other equations that you might be solving for, so your species, energy, uh, turbulence, radiation, so forth and so on. And I just have a couple of, so what do we got here? We got uh, turbulence, turbulence, uh, energy, and um, um, mixture fraction, which is a way of uh, handling uh, reactions in CFD. So again, you're not going to be tested over, you know, you're going to have to derive all of those equations on the test. And it's going to be a mandatory problem. So, to actually carry out a CFD, there's what, one, two, three, four, five, six steps. Uh, the first step is obviously to build the geometry. You have to have, you know, what, whether it be a um, 3D CAD or some other geometry, uh, you have to have, you know, the geometric representation of the object that you want to simulate. The next step is to take that geometry and discretize it into the computational mesh. Um, then you apply the equations, um, the conservation equations for the various physics that you want to simulate. Um, apply appropriate boundary conditions, i.e. saying, oh, I have, you know, one kilogram a second of air coming in this, on this boundary, and I have 0.05 kilograms per second of methane coming in on this boundary, stuff like that. Um, then you solve the equation, you solve the problem. Well, I say you, the computer actually solves it. Uh, you're not actually doing it by 
uh, by hand. And then, um, you know, visualize, analyze, uh, report the results. Basically, taking the results and making pretty pictures out of them. Which, incidentally, CFD also stands for Colorful Fuzzy Diagrams. Um, so, uh, geometry, uh, typically you're going to use, you know, something out of like SolidWorks or Inventor or, um, you know, another kind of 3D CAD um, product. Um, and then, like I mentioned, the geometry that CFD is interested in is the negative geometry. So, a lot of times you'll get the geometry from, you know, a drafter or a design group. But that's going to be the positive geometry. So you have to take that and convert it into the negative geometry. So basically you have to, you know, kind of fill it up with water and figure out what shape uh, the water would be. And then um, making the mesh, like I mentioned, it basically consists of taking that geometry and discretizing it into a finite number of uh, finite volume cells. And incidentally, the most common method of solving CFD is called the finite volume method. Um, and when I say, you know, you're discretizing it into a number of cells, uh, you know, this generally is in the millions of cells, uh, you know, in the tens of millions of cells. Uh, very large models can get into the hundreds of millions of cells or even billions of cells. Um, modern CFD tools can do this um, automatically, so you're not drawing, you know, 10 million cells. The, that you'd, you'd be there a long, long time, but the, the software itself is actually generating uh, the mesh for you. Uh, and in this area, the software has come a long way, even in the last decade or so. Um, you know, it used to be you know a pretty labor-intensive process where it might take you know two or three weeks to generate a good mesh. Uh, now it's just a matter of hours to do it. And then, like I mentioned, you know, depending on the complexity of, you know, both the geometry and also the physics that you're modeling. Uh, the mesh sizes can, can contain upwards of 50 million cells. Um, so a lot of uh, problems, or most problems, of industrial uh, interest um, are turbulent flow problems. So your flow is turbulent. Um, because it's, you know, basically random stochastic motion, um, capturing that in CFD is uh, a very difficult uh, thing to do. So what we do is, instead of actually running a transient simulation where we're actually capturing all of the turbulent motions, uh, we, we do what's called time averaging the, the uh, solution. Actually, we time average the equations uh, to form what are called Reynolds average Navier-Stokes or Farb average Navier-Stokes. Our uh, Reynolds average number of stokes is for constant density systems, and Farb average is for uh, varying density systems. And basically, what we do is we average out the time. So we say, you know, on average, what's the temperature at this point going to be, or what's the velocity at this point going to be? So that turns it from a transient problem into a steady state problem. Uh, the problem is that it introduces another set of equations that you have to solve for. Um, and they're, they're called the, the Reynolds stresses or the Favre stresses. Um, and those are some of the nonlinear terms in the, um, in the Navier-Stokes equations. So we have to use a turbulence model or a turbulence closure model to, um, to capture those effects. Um, and a lot, and there's, you know, several dozen different, you know, well-supported models out there and the knowledge of which particular model to use is where some of the expertise in, uh, in CFD is really required. So, um, you know, talk to a CFD engineer about which model you should be using. Uh, combustion, combustion at its very basic is fuel plus oxidizer forms products. Uh, and just like with turbulence, there's probably a hundred different ways to model combustion in CFD. Um, while the, the differences between the models are relatively easy to understand, um, 
being able to really choose which model is the correct model to use in a given situation is where a lot of um, expertise is required. So again, you know, if you're doing a combustion CFD model, uh, you know, make sure to involve a, you know, a CFD engineer uh, to help with some of the, the combustion model selection. And then one of the other um, interesting things about combustion CFD is thermal radiation. Flames are hot. They give off heat via radiation. Uh, and that's, you know, an important part especially when talking about, um, you know, process heating and um, flares and basically anything in kind of, you know, the industrial combustion space. Thermal radiation is, um, it's governed by an equation similar to the Navier-Stokes, but there's some um, distinct differences in that um, it's, it's directional. So you have a... Um, you have a ray of, you know, a photon of radiation that's going in a given direction. And you have to be able to account for all of that. Um, and so the solution methods for the radiation equation are similar to the solution methods that are used for Navier-Stokes, but a little bit different. Um, and for um, gas flame radiation, I don't know if you guys talked about this already, but most of the radiation is due to the CO2 and water vapor in, in the products. Uh, those two both absorb very heavily in the, infrared, in the infrared spectrum, and so therefore are the largest emitters of, uh, of thermal radiation. Other potential models, if you're doing uh, multiphase flow, you know, i.e., or e.g., gas liquid, um, gas solid, particulate laden flow, um, if you're dealing with uh, phase changes, i.e., if there's you know or, you know if there's boiling or something, uh, spray modeling. So if you're dealing with like a liquid atomizer where you're taking a liquid stream and you're breaking it up into a bunch of different droplets, uh, and then porous media, so uh, like packed beds, for example. So there's a lot more different types of um, of models out there. It's not just the couple that we talked about. When applying boundary conditions, um, there's basically three types of boundary conditions that you have to work. You have to worry about it's your your inlets, your outlets, and your walls, which pretty much covers everything. So your inlets are well inlets to the model. They're uh, inputting matter or inputting mass to the model. So generally, you know, you're saying what's the um, you know what what's the temperature, what's the pressure, what's the composition, what's the mass flow rate of those inlets. Um, and then outlets, you say, oh, you know, I'm exhausting to atmosphere, for example, or maybe there's, you know, something else downstream of what you're interested in and there's some uh, back pressure and you have to account for that in your um, boundary condition. And then when it comes to your wall boundary conditions, what well, that's mainly looking at is your, your thermal boundary conditions. So like if you're in a boiler, your your tube walls where the water is flowing, you're going to say, oh, you know, there, there's water on the other side. This is the heat transfer coefficient inside the tube, and this is the temperature of the water. So that so that the CFD simulation can effectively kind of you know suck that heat out of the model and into the tubes. And then also when setting setting the uh, boundary conditions, you're looking at uh, physical phenomena. So is, you know, is the flow laminar or turbulent? Um, if you're injecting droplets, you have to give it the droplet size, distribution, et cetera, stuff like that. Um, solving, uh, as, you, as you can imagine with, you know, say 100 million cells and, you know, there's you know, three velocity equations, one pressure, one energy, two turbulence, and then let's just say you have, um, what, eight species, that's 15. And then there's 24 radiation equations. Uh, so that's, what, 39 equations that you're solving. And if 100 million cells, so you basically have 3.9 billion unknowns and 3.9 billion equations. Um, you're not going to run that on your desktop. I mean, you could, I suppose, but I don't recommend it. <laughs> 
Um, so we, we run them on large um, clusters. You know, think supercomputer, but not like room size. Um, generally, a model at, at Zinc is going to run about a week on one of these uh, clusters. Uh, if you were to solve it on your desktop, you know, you're looking at 18 months, you know, to several years of seven days a week, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, so we're talking a lot of uh, compute power. And then lastly, you visualize or analyze your results. And this is um, kind of the, the fun part, I guess, where you get to make the pretty pictures. Um, you know, colorful fuzzy diagrams, colorful flow diagrams, colors for directors. You know, there's lots of fun other acronyms. Uh, basically, some of the things you're going to be looking at are, uh, you know, contours of uh, different, different variables. So you say, I want to draw a plane and color that plane by O2 concentration. Um, velocity vectors, you know, looking for, um, well, looking for flow flow vectors, uh, path line plots like we have here showing, you know, if you, you know, where, where, where is the flow going or how is the fluid flowing uh, in the enclosure. And there's a bunch of other different types of um, results that you can pull out, like some of those um, isosurfaces that we showed earlier. Um, a couple of just uh, case studies. Uh, first one, testing what's called an LPMF burner in uh, test furnace number four, um, out back, not out back at TU, but out back at Zinc. Uh, basically, that's sort of what it looks like in CFD in the CFD model of uh, the furnace itself, and then what it looks like with the flame. And basically, remember when I said that, you know, CFD, you can get, you know, all the variables basically everywhere. Whereas with um, you know, physical experiments, you can only get a you know, kind of pretty coarse um, discretization in there. And basically what we're doing here is we're looking at four different, or actually we're, so we're looking at dry O2 on the right and temperature on the left. And you probably can't see this very easily, but the square, the purple squares are the, uh, actually gone out and measured. So we actually stuck a water-cooled probe into the furnace and pulled out a sample and analyzed it. And then the, uh, the, the dark purple line with little diamonds on it is the CFD results. And as you can see, you know, it does match uh, pretty well. And there are areas where, you know, the, there are some, there is some deviation. But um, combustion modeling is one of the more difficult types of CFD modeling. You know, like I said, uh, turbulence models are still in active development in academia along with combustion models. So, um, you know, the combustion models are improving all the time and, you know, we still, you know, we're striving to improve our modeling methodologies to try to close this gap. But even the gaps that we see right now are still um, very good. And then basically taking that data from the test furnace and throwing it into, or not throwing it, but putting it into the customer's furnace. You know, we simulated the full-sized customer furnace before the burners were even manufactured uh, to make sure that the design was going to work um, uh, in, in the end result, in the end uh, installation. So uh, just some. Um, you know, marketing type talking points, you know, good agreement between measurements and CFD results, and it was modeled in the customer's furnace. Um, the second case study looking at um, flame impingement, basically meaning flame touching something uh, in a cracking furnace uh, with PXMR burners. Basically, the flames were rolling off the tubes, or rolling off the wall towards the tubes. So normally, in cracking furnaces, you want the flame basically attached to the wall. So the burner's placed right next to the wall, and you want that flame just kind of hugging the wall all the way up. 
but in this particular case, the flames were coming or detaching from the wall and rolling out towards the tubes. And cracking furnaces are generally run pretty close to the, to the metallurgical limits of the, of the tubes themselves. So if you have hot flame rolling over towards the tubes, uh, you start worrying about tube life. And the result of this was that the operation was limited to about 50% of the design capacity. So the heater was only running at 50% of what it was originally designed to do because of this rollover issue. And it's kind of hard to see in this video, but the tubes are over on the left, and then the wall is over on the right, and you see the, the flames kind of flickering over and rolling over to the tubes. No bueno. So uh, basically we took the layout of the customer furnace where you know, the circles are tubes, the boxes are burners, and basically said, that, oh, well, you know, these are, you know, it's symmetrical about the tubes, and then we cut a slice out and call that kind of a periodic um, solution. So looking at the 3D model of the burner, uh, kind of cut down the middle, there's a uh, throat baffle to help uh, distribute the air in, in the middle there. And then these red and uh, purple guys are the primary and stage tips. So those are the gas tips that have the ports in them that have the, the sonic, the choked flow going through, going through them that we talked about on Thursday. So when we did our first simulation, uh, this is the results that we saw. We saw exactly what they were seeing out in the field. The flame was detaching from the wall, rolling over towards the tubes. So it kind of rolls over, i.e., you know, it leaves the wall and kind of curves back over towards the tubes. So rather than go out to the field and replace the gas tips on, you know, 50 burners or however many burners they had, we basically, in CFD, evaluated different drillings on the gas tips. So basically we played with the port size and where the ports are kind of aiming the fuel. And we went through nine different iterations and, finally, and came up with a, um, with a set of uh, gas tips or a set of gas drillings where the flame now hugs the wall and stays attached to the wall and is no longer rolling over um, in CFD. So kind of, again, a before and after, before you see the flame detaching from the wall, rolling over towards the tubes, no bueno, and then after the flame staying attached to the wall, which is bueno. So um, I don't have a movie, but you can kind of see everything looks nice and even in the furnace now. There's no kind of hazy flame kind of flickering around. Uh, the flame stays where it should be and stays away from where it shouldn't be. Uh, and then just some talking points. I'm going to kind of um, skip those. So concluding remarks, um, you know, CFD is a great way to do, um, you know, exploration and experimentation without having to actually physically build something. Uh, but that's not to say that you should use only CFD and not do any physical testing. Uh, where the real value comes is where you have physical tests with which to tune and compare your model against. So it really works hand in hand with physical experimentation and testing. Um, and you know, it's not just kind of the combustion industry, but industries, you know, all industries are basically starting to really use CFD to you know more rapidly um, develop products and to develop um, you know better quality, better quality products, better products, whatnot. That's kind of the show. Yeah. What percentage of like your jobs do you use CFD models? So the question is, what percentage of our jobs do we use CFD? It really depends what type of job it is. So for the uh, process heating type um, jobs, it's nearly 100%. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that a lot of refineries or I mean, you know, you, you, I'm sure you've seen the, 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 
thing on the news or whatever says, you know, a new refinery hasn't been built since the, the, the 80s or whatever in the U.S. So a lot of the facilities at a lot of the uh, refineries in the U.S. are relatively old, and they were designed for different types of burners. And the new generation of burners that are lower emission have different requirements than the older higher emissions burners. And uh, sometimes, sometimes you can't just swap them out. And so we use, the C we use CFD to try to um, identify these issues before installation, and we can work on mitigation strategies. Yeah. You said running the models takes about a week. Yep. Usually, on average, like how many different models do you try for a given circumstance before you find one that works? Um, generally, we've gotten pretty good now. So, um, I mean, generally, it's you know the first or second. Anybody else? All righty.